Hey, welcome to another edition of uh, Kyle Meredith Myth. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks, as always, for making your way here. Check out the series. Ah, you know what to do. Like what you see, what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week, so it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists. And I've got one of my all-time favorites, Louise Post of Veruca Salt. Hello. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I'm I'm great. It's great to have you on here. You've got uh, you you've well, I, I'd say new music, and that's sort of true. It's new to us, right? But uh, but you've been digging into the archives for a bit. Uh, there's a new release called uh, "But I Love You Without Mascara" demos ninety seven to ninety eight. Uh, I, I first got to say, what a treat this has been uh, for the fans right here. What what um, what made you go crate digging? Well, um, I digitized some old footage, some old like home movies from the camcorder that I had out in the 90s, like following my friends around and on tour and everything. And um, and I was doing some documenting back then. Um, and so I and I had this friend of mine named Matt Fass, who was the drummer on a couple of the songs that I demoed at that time. And he kept bugging me to release these songs. And honestly, I'd forgotten about them. And I said, do you have them? And he said, yeah, I have them. One of them is not only my favorite song of yours, but one of my, he said, it's my all time favorite song. To be honest, that's what he said. And I was like, all right, then send them to me and I'll give it a listen. And that was a few years ago. And then he did it, he did it again. I did a collaboration with him on a song he put out called Angels Are Singing, which is a tribute to Chris Cornell. It's a lovely song under his band moniker, Backyard Star. And at the time he's like, all right, so when are we doing But I Love You Without Mascara? Because I had already decided that was the name um, because it's the last thing I say on, on one of the songs. And I said it to my best friend and he's like, I said, oh my God, we, I have to do that. I have to do that. And finally I digitized this footage and around the same time I told another friend about it and she said, let's just make it happen. And it worked out so beautifully because I didn't know really that anyone would care or listen or you know want to want to buy it want to hear it um but i it was a it was an important thing it turned out for me to do because it really um reconnected me with a lot of fans who did actually care did want to listen and um were interested in demos and were interested in that time that chapter and um what i did with the footage was i made a, uh, I, I learned how to edit just for the, just to put this, make this video. Um, I grabbed a couple other demos from, I demos from two different sessions and um, kept it simple, made it short, but made a video um, for the song, Used to Know Her, which, and the demo, I that the song came out on what became Resolver, but, um, which was my first Veruca Salt record without the original band members. And it was an, you know, an album of just heart of heartbreak, really. And um, we now in the band, you know, proper, we call it Veruca Starship, just to be clear. That's our like, that's our little loving moniker for that chapter of Veruca Salt. Um, but this, the song Used to Know Her actually came about, um, you know, in 97, turning into 98. And I I had started writing it about my stepmother with whom I had always had, to, always had this contentious relationship and it turned into, and then I worked on it with Nina before we split up. And then um, I released it on Resolver and it came this sort of emblematic of, of our breakup and, and it always people assumed it was about her. So I just reimagined it and didn't use footage of Nina, just used footage of my best friend at the time and my other best friend and um and my roommate and um my other bestie and and just that tried to capture that time but it was also sort of um I guess what this EP became for me was a gentle closing of the door on that chapter and on the past and temporarily on Veruca Assault because we're just on a hiatus and I'm making a solo record and so um it has felt really right to do this and the songs are they're very dear you know and I look back and I, I do feel like I used to know that person and I'm not that person anymore although I I have a lot of like tender feelings and empathy for that person I feel very different now yeah it's it's interesting you, you know perception you know how how fans listen to it and what they want to read into it because of course we don't know what they're actually about unless you say it 
uh, that track right there. I mean, it, even listening to, it's obviously a heartbreak EP. I think that part does come across, but you get those with the, the line in float, uh, can it be my anchor is floating away from me? I see her exploding so far at the sea. And yeah, we go, is, who is that about? Is, it, is that about the band? Is that, you know, it, those, those moments do seem to kind of flow uh, I guess to, to stay along with that whole metaphor of the uh, the float. Well, that was, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you straight out, that was absolutely about Nina. I was like, you know, that was clearly about her. But then the next verse, I say, "Can it be my sister?" Um, is going. I can't remember now. So far from me, she's tired of knowing our family. And that was a double entendre because my big sister left, she was nine years older than I, and she left for college when I was a kid, you know, and, and I was, that was devastating to have my sister go leave St. Louis and go to California. And I feel like I lost her, you know? And so I think this was the loss of Nina was, was uh, reminiscent of that feeling. Um, so that was also cathartic, you know, to finally write those lyrics about that moment. I was like, wow, that I've been holding on to that for a long time. <laughs> but it was really like a moment. I, you know, it was a moment in time that was so short, but it occupied so much psychological space for so long for me. And in, in a way, like, you know, I really want to put that to bed. Like it's and that's what this has become. And 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 that's what's been personally, you know, nice for me is just to go like, okay. I see you 97, like, let's put, let's put this all to bed now. Um, it's just, it's like uh, time for time for that to maybe be heard and, and say goodbye to that, you know, um, because I really felt at that moment, like um, the two people that I thought were the loves of my life were not who I thought they were. And it was so, I was, I was really like knocked out of the knees. I felt like I'd been hit by a truck and I was trying to make sense of it. Um, and I'm not unique in that everyone has been through something like this. I hope not to that extent, but you know, people go through stuff like this. And, um, and then the question came up, like, is it me? Is, am I the one, am I the common denominator? Am I too much to bear? Am I too intense? Um, and there became, there came a chapter in my life after that, where I was like, you know what, I'm not going to confront people about stuff. I'm just not going to, I'm going to be low maintenance. I'm just going to be, and I don't think I succeeded at all, <laughs> but I tried, I tried really hard to be low maintenance. Um, but yeah, but that was sort of it. Like, you know, some of those lyrics are like, um, you know, you, you need to go sore without me. Like you're, I'm too dark. It's like that, the unbearable lightness of being that beautiful book and movie with Juliette Binoche and Daniel Day-Lewis. I'll never forget the, the line when she says, um, you're just, I'm just so dark and you're so light, something like that. And that's how I was feeling at that time. Like, um, my moodiness or whatever stuff I'm carrying around from my past is, is too heavy for you. So you need to go soar without me. And those songs really were like a release of, of people, you know? It's, that's interesting too, because, you, you know, we hear so many artists talking about writing as a form of uh, catharsis. And mm -hmm. for a lot of people that's, that's in the moment, this song helps them within that moment. Uh, unless I'm getting it wrong here, I almost get the feeling like you got that moment 25 years after or, or, you know, 23 years after like, like that, that moment of, uh, of help through writing that song may have taken a little bit long, like, like, were these songs tainted by the era in that moment? I, well, I didn't put, I, I put one of them, um, of the four I recorded in LA, I put one of them, one of them became a B-side on Resolver, um, of the two I recorded in, in Chicago, one of them ended up on Resolver, um, but the other ones, um, they were, they, I don't know if I didn't think they were good enough um, or, you know, some songs just can't make it on the record. I, but I also just kind of, I think um, they were so confessional and I'm not to say that anything on Resolver wasn't, but something about these songs, uh, they were just so confessional that it was, I think, too, 
too much for me to like revisit them in a in an in a, like a studio setting and do them properly yeah yeah and and they're they're almost like what's the word i'm looking for meditations in a way i mean these are long songs a lot of them you know clock well over five minutes i mean you were <laughs> like like did you did, were you kind of i don't know I don't know how much you remember about the moments you were writing these songs or not, but you're aware of how they sounded like, did you envision them as thinking like, this is going to be another Veruca album, you know, these songs? Well, yeah, for sure. I was writing these demos for our net, what would be our next record together as a band. At the same time, there was something um, in hindsight, there's something to uh, something to the fact that I was right demoing on my own in, in LA without the band. I think I intended to bring them to the band and then flesh them out as we were assault songs, but there was also something in the air. There was also like, there was some kind of question mark. And I, I remember being somewhat conscious of that then, sort of wanting to strike out on my own, um, but not being ready to make that move on my own. And, um, and we had much more in us as a band. We just personally couldn't hold it together. And, you know, thankfully we finally pulled it together and, made ghost notes and reunited in 2012 um you guys wrote a really kind review about us uh for that record it was and i i adored that record and i adored that whole chapter it was the most cathartic triumphant amazing you know record to have made at that time and um we're all really proud of it yeah we're all really yeah, happy the review at uh, Consequence, and we still play Laughing the Sugar Bowl and uh, St. Me on WFBK. I mean, that's to me, those songs are as great as, uh, you know, all the songs that you all are, you know, the classics that you might be known for. I mean, that's such a great record still. Thank you so much. Right now. Thank yeah. You. No, uh, I love that. And, you know, and, and, and as we talk a little bit more about, uh, about this one, um, uh, Mascara for shorts. I don't know if it, we're already shortening it or whatever, but um, oh, yeah. uh, because that's the thing, you know, as we talk about, uh, some obvious heartache within it you get to a song like uh, color you black and that's it feels like this is now someone that's keeping their guard up you know so for whatever has happened that that's how I'm hearing it anyway is like and now the guard is up yeah. right here like do, uh, can you talk a little bit I personally like that one quite a bit so I'd love to hear about it thank you that's definitely my favorite of the bunch um it's funny that I never released it. And and I actually played it for Nina when we were working on Ghost Notes because we had various demos that we had done over the years that we hadn't released um, or had released in some form, but we gave each other each a mix of these songs to put on the chopping block and maybe put do together. So that was one of them and she loved it, but we just never went back to it. Um, anyway, that was the one I was really referencing when I was saying, um, yeah, or thinking about the lyrics. Um, that was when I was definitely putting up the guard. That was just a beautiful way of putting it, Kyle. I think that's really exactly what was happening. Like, if this can happen, um, like, you know, the the guy I was with, I, I thought would be my forever guy. And he, uh, you know, wasn't capable of it, didn't think the same way, but it was very clear to me that that's where we were going. And, um, and he stepped out on me and in a public way. And I was, um, I was so blindsided and so, so shocked. And, um, and I just decided at that moment, um, nothing, I'm not going to let anything ever hurt me like that again that's it and you go soar and um and be who you need to be but I'm gonna be over here in my corner and I'm never gonna let anyone hurt me like that again and I haven't well I can completely understand why you might not have wanted that one out right away but uh as vulnerable yeah. as it is but uh now that with time I'm so happy you released that one because it's a beautiful beautiful statement right there. Thank you. It's definitely was a moment in time. And um, I don't wish that on anybody, but I'm really glad I wrote the song when I did. I'm glad that I that I made something of that moment that was meaningful. And I'm glad that um, that other people seem to identify with it and, it and it seems to resonate with with some. Yeah. Um, 
with all that said, there does seem to be a little bit of camaraderie, especially when you get to the end with Complete Me, uh, and you've got some uh, some folks on there, um, Pat oh, yeah. Schmier, uh, James Eha, I know uh, two of them. How did they end up on the song? Is it like everybody hanging out in the studio? Is that a late night party? What is that? Yeah, I mean, it was all kind of a big party at that time, and we... I, I don't even, I had forgotten that Pat sang on it. And um, I remember James being there, but my drummer, Matt, for that session reminded me, yeah, Pat was there too. Don't forget. Cause I sent him a copy of the credits and he's like, I have video of us with me with Pat during that time. Um, I did not include in used to know her, but um, we were hanging in LA and I must've said like, come on over. And like I need gang vocals. And I just had everyone going la 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 la. It was just really fun. So it was really truly just like everyone in the studio, come on over, let's hang out. Yeah. And that's kind of a fun part, especially when you know who's doing it. You know, that's uh to get that in there. So yeah. Is there more to these? Do you, you know, you talked about how it's kind of been, in, in, uh, you know, cool to see uh, people embrace demos. Do you see releasing more from the vault like this? You know, because people have liked it so much and the vinyl went so fast, like I, before I could blink my eye, um, it's been, I, I, it's been, uh, you know, presented to me, proposed to me to do another one. And I do have certainly a lot more in the vault. Um, that would be really fun. It'd be really fun to do that. It'd be fun to do one with Nina too. Um, cause we have a lot of demos that, that we did on four track together. Um, but, uh, so yeah, that could happen, but, um, I'm going to wait because, uh, I'm focusing on the record that I'm making. That is the first record I've ever released. Well, you know, mascara aside, now that we call it that, um, under my own name under like out of the under not under the Veruca assault moniker so it's uh it's it's all it's like you know wonderful and terrifying and um exhilarating and all of those things yesterday i was well just this last weekend um i was taking with driving my kid up to camp and they had just bought a bunch of shirts from hot topic and one of them was a nirvana shirt and not so long ago, they were blasting Smells Like Teen Spirit in my car. And I was like, how do you know this song? Oh, no, you know what happened? It was the opposite. I was <laughs> I was yelling. I, I was singing a lot. I was like, I guess we're rocking out to Smells Like Teen Spirit now. I don't know how or why. But so I was singing along and my, my kid goes, um, how do you know this song, mom? I'm like, wow. I was like, how do I know this song? I'm like, how do you know this song? You're 12. Yeah. And they're like... Uh, TikTok. So anyway, that said, they bought a Nirvana shirt off of at Hot Topic. And I was like, really? We're doing this now? And they said, it's trending. I'm like, okay, here's the deal. If you're going to wear that Nirvana shirt, you're going to know the music. So find Bleach on Spotify and let's go. And so <laughs> we listened to that and um, and I, and the song, it inspired, well, eventually I will tell you that we got past swap meet and I was like, you got to turn this off. I'm it's too depressing. There's something about it, the, that particular record. I was like, I can't take any more. And um, I was like, can you find me something poppy and happy? And they're like, I got you, mom. So they put on, um, I like you by Post Malone, which is my jam. And then I was like, thank you. And then we sang along to that and bopped our way up the five freeway. But um, anyway, so, but it inspired this song that I just wrote for this, for the record. And the record is much more, um, the record I'm making right now is, I don't know, I don't know. I never know what to call things, but um, like, I never understood alternative rock. That was ridiculous to me. I was like, I think it's just rock. I don't understand why you have to call it alternative, but okay. Um, now, I, I don't care, but <laughs> now it's like, I think what I'm doing, when I think of indie rock, I think of, uh, I guess it's more indie pop. I guess you would say that. Mm -hmm. Coming out on independent, it's kind of pop, but it's not pop like Taylor Swift pop. It's like, um, it's certainly influenced by everyone I've listened to. Um, and um, this, it hasn't been like overtly rock and roll, not really. And so I wrote this song having been listening to Bleach that was like 
why don't I just write a rock song? It, you know, let's just, and I just wrote the song and I thought the cool thing about, it's pretty dark. And the cool thing about doing this on my own is that I don't have to pass it through the Nina Gordon pop uh, filter because she'll go like, oh, wheeze. It's like laughing in the sugar bowl. I had a version where she was like, I can't find my way in. We have to keep working on it. And finally we did and it landed. And I was so happy that it was ours, you know? And this song, I, I know that it's it's like, doesn't have to go through. I don't have to pass it by anybody. Mm -hmm. But then I brought it into the studio and my producer was like, wow, it's kind of dark, man. <laughs> Jesus. He's like, can we just make it a little more Iggy Pop? Like add some hand claps and some key, some piano. I'm like, okay, okay, I hear you. Like, let's just do this. Um, let's do, we can work on this and try to ever make everyone happy. But um, it was so cathartic to write this song. And that said, it's not really typical of what the record sounds like. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of this. Like through like my, my husband is an audiophile and it is a vinyl addict and um i mean our house is so full of albums so full of records that he has to start selling some to get them out because there's not room and it's great because he turns me on to bands like this is the kit or yellow ostrich or like he has has every damien gerardo record um he's a giant trail of dead fan um I mean, he loves, um, he loves sleep, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while we're on the topic, my husband is in a band called the Brontosaur that just made, just finished, he just finished his record and it's his epic masterpiece. And I cannot wait for it to be out and people to hear it. And he's working on this intense, like 12 page booklet right now. And it's going to be a double vinyl. And he's just, it's gotta be right, you know, cause he's really into vinyl art and vinyl colors and, and he found the right artist and the artist loves the music and he's just geeking out over that right now. And I'm really excited for the Brana store um, to come out um, the this album. Um, but anyway, I got lost in my story. No, what an exciting time for both of you all though, to, to, to be, you know, creating all this stuff. And, and I, I was thinking back to, you know, the beginning of the story when your, your, your kids ask you, you know, how do you know this song, which is hilarious. I'd, I'd had this behind me, this uh, this disc behind me, which was a CD-ROM from Blender, and I, the, the, the headline I hated, so I've had it hidden, but it just works so funny for now that it says, the next Nirvana from Veruca Salts. It also says, or be great breeders, which, you know, it's... Uh... <laughs> nice. So glad they got that in there. Yeah, uh, but, uh, but I love that, you know, Veruca Salt, the next Nirvana, that's... Uh... Yeah, no, that's really nice. I didn't even see that there. It, you're, yeah. you're hiding over my shoulder, just peeking, just peeking oh, over there. That's so sweet. We took that, that picture was taken at, um, um, sorry, famous venue in San Francisco at the Fillmore. Reason, yeah, at the Fillmore. I kept oh. thinking the forum. I'm like, no, it's, it was at the Fillmore backstage before we opened for a hole. Um, and what I was going to say was that my kid is really into pop and they have really good taste. Like they, I really appreciate their taste. It's not just bland pop, but they got really into Billie Eilish. And um, through, I just inadvertently started, became a fan and then became a fan of her brother Phineas and just saw Phineas at this surprise show at the Troubadour here in LA. And, um, and so it's like this, the record that I'm making now is more of like this pop infusion, but it's also influenced by like, I mean, I love also love Imagine Dragons and um, my world just sort of opened up because both I have these both to the two people in my house um, are introducing me to so much different stuff and I'm listening to it all. Um, and it was kind of the medicine during the pandemic. Um, sorry, the pandemic is still alive and well, but mm -hmm. during the lockdown and the quarantine and during that period of time, um, music just sort of was the bomb. Yeah. I just had Phineas on the show and yeah, he is uh, incredible. Just, you know, what he, what he does, but, but that's exciting. I mean, hearing, you know, that this is where you're coming from on this, like, I cannot wait to hear 
what all this actually means in the songs and in the sounds. Uh, so uh, do, do you know the release plan yet? Is that something you can talk about? Um, it's funny, I'm having a meeting with uh, later today at the studio, um, the guy who runs my record label, which is what Ghost Notes came out on, El Camino, is coming by the studio just to check it out and see what we're doing. And it's being produced by um, Matt Drenick of um, Battle Me, and he's produced a bunch of records. He has a, a record label called Get Loud, and he's uh, he's also a formidable musician and um, did all the music for Sons of Anarchy and um, has released tons of albums. So he's, and he's my dude. Like I, I was not in the mood on the, any of this to go like shop my wares or like <laughs> call people like cold, like just get in touch with people and say like, will you listen to my songs? That said, after this album, I am not, I'm not beneath sending it to Phineas and saying, um, if you have time, if you ever have time, would you considering producing me like a song, whatever it is? Like, I adore him, and um, I think the world of him. Um, and just met him also at the uh, after the Olivia Rodrigo show, which she covered Seether. So that had I went to that, and um, and I didn't know she, you were there. I remember seeing the thing with her doing it, but I don't think I knew that you were there as well. Oh yeah. I, well, I was there in LA. I was there at the Greek. Uh -huh. And then we, there was an after show and uh, Phineas was there and um, my kid just geeked out and just went up to him and took a selfie. And then um, he was very sweet. He was so sweet and, and so humble. And, um, and so, um, and then I totally geeked out and approached him and met his lovely girlfriend and, you know, and told him how much his work means to me. So um anyway we can move on from Phineas but I didn't want to get that in there <laughs> manifesting is what we're doing right that's that's what people yeah, say we're just putting exactly. that out there in the world we're so putting it's, it out there yeah he's a great producer too I've been following him on that I mean and he does score work see you said move on and what did I do I just have more praise for okay, Phineas but okay. uh, we can keep going with it I could talk about <laughs> Phineas all day I'm so in love with his new record like I can't get over it yeah well let me throw it back to you again uh but I love you without mascara demo is 97 98 this is such a great time capsule and it's so great to hear these songs. I'm so happy that you did put these out. I'm so looking forward to hearing what this new album uh, is gonna sound like with all these influences you're talking about. I mean, seriously, Louise, you've been uh, such a great songwriter and and, and important. Uh, the music that you've made has been important to me throughout my life. So I'm so happy you're continuing to do it. That's really nice to hear. That's the ultimate ultimate compliment. It means the world to me. and um, I can't wait to release this album. It's going to come out in 2023 to answer your question. And um, hopefully I'll be doing some touring and possibly releasing a single later in 2022. All right. It's the beginning of a new career, a solo career, officially. Yeah, it is that. Yeah. Yeah. So and keep we'll it going. I, I plan to. You know what? I feel like um, that I'm being called to do this by something bigger than myself maybe it's not like i'm dying to make a record and go on tour i honestly don't feel that way i like i like to kick it with my family and um do other stuff i even thought about going to nursing school because i really want to do that i don't have time though because i have to make this blasted record um so like i need a lot of lifetimes to do all the stuff i want to do um but this is what i'm doing now because i feel really compelled to do it I just feel like I have to. Yeah. Well, we'll be there for it. I cannot wait to hear it. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it today. Oh, definitely. Anytime. <laughs>